President Balatinubu approved the Infrastructure Support Fund for all 36 states to cushion the effects of petrol subsidy removal. Now, the funds will be deployed in critical areas like transportation, agriculture, health, education, power, and water resources. And out of the June 2023 revenue of 1.9 trillion naira, 907 billion naira will be distributed among the three tiers of government, while 790 billion naira will be saved. The new savings culture is aimed at minimizing the impact of increased revenues from subsidy removal, and the savings will complement the ISF and other fiscal measures to improve Nigerian lives. Now, joining me for this discussion, I have Dr. Muda Yusuf, CEO, Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprises. He joins me from Lagos, Nigeria. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure to be with you, and uh, good morning to all our viewers. All right, now, uh, how far-reaching, from your own point of view, do you think the establishment of the Infrastructure Support Fund for the 36 states of the Federation will be in cushioning the effects of the petrol subsidy uh, removal on the people, most especially putting into consideration the issues that has to do with inflation and exchange rates? Well, the first, the whole idea, I think, is a welcome development because uh, as a country, one of the biggest impediments to productivity is infrastructure. And if you must grow any economy, uh, you must prioritize uh, expenditure on infrastructure. So now that the government is having a much better fiscal space, I think it's only logical that we must comment the whole idea of setting aside some of these funds to support infrastructure. So it's very good uh, for productivity, for job creation, and ultimately uh, for the welfare of the people. But in terms of, you know, tying down, I mean, tying that to the whole idea of cushioning the effects of uh, the uh, based on subsidy removal, I don't think that may immediately fit the current situation. Because in part of infrastructure is a medium to long term thing. The pain that people are suffering now has to do with high cost of food, high cost of energy, and high cost of transportation. So we need to, you know, remodel it in a way to be able to deliver some short term immediate relief, you know, for the citizens. So as far as the issue of uh, impact of square subsidy removal is concerned, I think what is most paramount are the quick wins. What can bring immediate relief? That's of the cost of food, cost of transportation, and cost of energy. That for me is, uh, is, is what is paramount at this time. And secondly, there have been some you know, uh, debates as to the legality of the fund. Of course, the president didn't impose it on anybody. Uh, it was a decision of uh, all the governors to set aside the fund. But again, uh, the lawyers have argued that it is appropriate to have a legal framework, you know, that will inform that kind of decision. So that it's not just a fund that will just be hanging in the air, to not be a fund that will just be managed, you know, without an appropriate legal framework. So uh, I believe that also needs to be that that needs to be tackled. Now, doctor, you've talked about uh, immediate relief and um, having a model uh, as which uh, they, uh, the government can actually help in mitigating the impact of the fuel subsidy. And uh, we know that the government has um, been open about issues. Uh, I've been open about uh, measures that has to do with. Um, uh, ruling out palliatives, giving out palliatives, um, improving the social register to see how many Nigerians can get some sorts of, uh, some sums of money um, to actually, you know, um, live by, even as um, these uh, different economic measures come into place. Some people have actually thrown their wings, uh, their weight behind what the government is trying to do in this area. But some people have said that, based on the issue of distrust between the government and the people that um, there might just be a possibility that these funds will not be used for the intended purpose and might just be a conduit by which some element or some certain people will siphon the money. So when we have issues of public distrust, and you're talking about immediate relief for the people, 
where or how do you think the government should strike the balance? No, what needs to happen, in my view, and going by our previous experience uh, on matters like this, as much as possible, I think we should avoid issues of physical or distribution of cash or physical distribution of materials. Uh, we have had similar experience under the social investment program of the previous administration. Uh, they, there was this social register, there was all manner of controversy around the credibility of the register. And that controversy has also resurfaced when the new administration was proposing uh, the issue of cash transfers. So because of the quality of data and because of the trust deficit when it comes to managing cash transfers, I think the balance of view, or my own view, is that we should move away from the whole idea of cash transfer. Because there is no way we can have a register that will be very credible if it is going to be managed either by the state or the federal, because the politicians will get involved. And before you know what is happening, you see a register filled with uh, party loyalists. You know, so those are some of the risks that we face when we go through that route. So in terms of immediate relief, I think some of the governors have been taking some right steps. Some of them have been buying buses, for instance. So if they invest a lot more in, uh, in, in, in buses for mass transit in their states, that will go a long way in bringing relief. If they invest in uh, this uh, CNG conversion kits for their states, you know, they buy it in large volumes and distribute it maybe at a subsidized uh, price to vehicle owners within their states so that they can easily convert their engines uh, from uh, use of uh, petrol to the use of CNG. And they can also collaborate with the investors that are providing the CNG in their various states. So that rather than be distributing money, they can install all these CNG pump stations around their states, support the provision of uh, the conversion kits, so that people can move away from the use of PMS to the use of CNG, which from all we have been told, are far, far cheaper than the use of either diesel or the use of PMS. So those are some of the things that can deliver some quick wins at the sub-national level. At the federal level, we should be looking more around issues of policy. How can we reduce import duty on some critical items, you know, that can bring soccer immediately to Nigerians? Things that are, related, that are related to food production or food importation or intermediate products for those who are in food production. Things that are related to the CNG. I mean, we can be talking about fiscal policies, incentives to encourage more people to go to, to for the use of CNG and to encourage more investors in that space. We can also do something for the SMEs, you know, in terms of tax breaks, tax waivers, you know, we can do a lot also for manufacturers. That's of reducing import duty on their raw material. So there's a whole lot that can happen at the policy level. So it has to be a combination of all of the, but as much as possible, I think we should avoid uh, the issue of uh, this cash transfers. All right, you have mentioned um, several areas that you feel that governments can plug these particular funds, but then let's look at it from the perspective of the government. Now, the fund will be deployed into transportation, agriculture, health, education, power, and water resources, part of what you actually mentioned. But I'd like to find out how critical do you consider these areas, and do you think it will have a lasting impact on Nigerians? Because we are looking at how to tie this to immediate reliefs. I mean, that there have been several funds allocated to these sectors way back in time from previous administrations up to now that has not really yielded much. So what do you con uh, consider as critical? And in terms of impact, how far reaching do you feel it will go? Well, those areas you mentioned are key. But again, let me emphasize, the challenges that the citizens are facing and the businesses are facing right now, as far as the recent policy reforms are concerned, are one, 
the high cost of food, high cost of transportation, high cost of energy. Now, if you must do anything around these areas, we can look at, first of all, we need to engage stakeholders in that sector. If you are thinking of bringing down the cost of food, we need to engage the stakeholders in that in the food production chain, in the entire agri chain, to identify what the critical bottlenecks are and how we can bring down the cost of food. Of course, the number one thing is security. Because we are talking of domestic production of food. The bigger constraints today to domestic food production is insecurity. So that is that is clear to everybody. So the government needs to address that and address it very quickly. Beyond that, there are issues that the players in the sector can come up with. We can have inputs or suggestions around how we can improve access to farm or agricultural inputs, how we can improve agriculture processing, how we can improve the preservation of agriculture products, how do we improve the marketing and sales and distribution of agriculture? How do we improve on the funding of the agricultural sector so that they can have access to much uh, cheaper funding? But then, doctor, so we, we have. We, but then, we, doctor, we, doctor, we, doctor, 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 sorry to cut in. We have had several contributions, fundings, government interventions in all these areas, and they've not really, they've not really yielded much. So, is the problem with the funding? or probably with the handlers of these funds when it comes to implementing um, the reforms or implementing what these funds are meant for in its actuality? That is why I was talking about engaging stakeholders. Because you, you cannot just sit in offices, maybe you are talking to consultants or talking to bureaucrats, and just come up with a policy and begin to implement. If you engage the stakeholder, they will tell you where the challenges have been in the past. Because the government cannot understand a sector better than those who are in that sector. So that we can do things differently, so that we can improve the quality of intervention. That is why I was talking about stakeholder engagement. I mean, you are in broadcasting, for instance. If the government wants to support broadcasting. The best thing to do is to engage investors in broadcasting. Ask them, what are your pain points? What are your barriers? And if there are programs in the past that has not benefited them, you get ideas on how to improve on the implementation. So stakeholder engagement is very critical to make the policies and interventions a lot more impactful so that we don't repeat the, the mistakes of the past. So you can do that for food. You can do that for transportation. For instance, with respect to transportation, the government can take a decision to reduce import duty on vehicles, especially buses. Right now, the import duty on those things is, 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 is around 30 or 35 percent. Imagine the government takes a decision today and says, we are reducing the import duty on buses by 50 percent. You can imagine the impact on the transportation sector. Okay. That's a low-hanging fruit. That well, is not costing the government any big money. Of course. Are policy changes. Of course. We have seen some um, state governors have actually um, given out some um, electric cars, made some electric cars available, and um, some has, have actually subsidized um, transportation for the public in some areas. But then let's look at the funding now. Uh, according to the statement, some of the funds will come from whatever the three tiers of government agree to save from the FACC. Uh, where else do you think the funding can come from, and what do you make of the saving culture of these tiers of government? You see, uh, there are some legal issues that have been raised around this funding. First, there's the issue as to whether there's a legal framework to support the whole idea of the funding. You know, we have the Nigerian Investment, uh, Nigeria uh, Sovereign uh, Investment Authority. Nigeria Sovereign Investment Authority is established by law. And that authority or that agency has been set up to manage savings from this kind of situation. Either savings from excess revenue or savings from excess account and things like that. So it's a savings framework. 
which has been set up by government. So whatever savings we have, by law, it is this sovereign, uh, sovereign investment authority that normally manages those savings. And it's a very professionally well-run authority. That is NSIA, uh, uh, Nigeria Sovereign Investment Authority. So the thinking of quite a number of analysis that if you have such savings, let's hand it over to the Sovereign Investment Authority. They are professional fund managers. They can relate with the states on what kind of intervention, what kind of infrastructure they want to develop. Infrastructure challenges vary from state to state. It's not something we can manage from a central location. The kind of infrastructure you need in uh, Bayesa is not the, the same kind of infrastructure you will need in, in Bornu or in Kebbi. So the states ultimately should have a say as to what kind of infrastructure they want to invest in. We have things like road infrastructure. We have electricity infrastructure, especially now that we are decentralizing electricity. Quite a number of states may have their own program on how to invest in electricity for their people. Mm. We have issues of irrigation. For those states that are agro-based, they want to invest a lot more in irrigation so that they can have all year round farming. We have ICT infrastructure. For some of them that want to enable their youth, you know, to go more, to be more savvy in terms of IT. We have IT backbone, fiber, fiber optics, uh, cables, and things like that for some states. So the priorities vary. So we should, we should have a very good framework for the management of the fund. Let us use the instrumentality or the platform of the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority to manage these funds. Let them liaise with the states to determine their priorities. But the concept of savings is good. The concept of infrastructure fund is good, even within the framework of the Nigeria Sovereign Investment Authority. That's an infra infrastructure fund. That's a stabilization fund. That's a future generations fund. This is already established. Okay. So we don't need to duplicate distance. All right. Let's get them involved so that we professionally manage this fund. All right, Dr. Eleron, you talked about um, having this intervention or this fund being extended in terms of support to um, small and medium um, enterprises. Now, looking at the private sector, the informal sector, and their workers, do you think or do you think that they stand a chance to benefit um, from the rollout of these funds? No, supporting the SMEs can be both uh, from the fiscal side in terms of investments or provision of some support. It can also be from the monetary side. You know, within the monetary uh, framework or monetary intervention framework, there's an SME window for funding. You know, at least we had that fund under MFLA. Of course, there may be issues as to how properly it was implemented, but the principle is good. We can revisit it. If you need to fine tune the implementation strategy we do so. So through the development finance window, we can support the SMEs in terms of funding. It's not everything that needs to come directly from the post of the government. The central bank has all manner of intervention funds. So through that window, we can provide funds, single digit funds, long tenure, maybe 10 years uh, fund for SMEs. That will be something that will be good for them. Then from the fiscal policy side, we can begin to look at a threshold, you know, uh, be, below which we, we exempt them from taxation. Presently, they have a threshold of, I think, uh, 25 million turnover. Any SME that is, has a turnover of 25 million and below are exempted from company tax, they are exempted from VAT. We can improve the threshold, maybe to around 40 million, so that more SMEs will be exempted from these taxes, so they have more room to be able to invest more and expand their businesses. Then the government should have a deliberate policy. Again, the policy is there, but the implementation is the issue. 
of patronizing what is produced by these SMEs and what is even produced by local industries. That are important, I mean, through the procurement processes, important things from abroad. That will also help them. Then this issue of conversion to CNG. Many of them are running generators at a very expensive pro prohibitive, prohibitive rate mm -hmm. or cost. So we can subsidize this conversion so that more people, more uh, SMEs, and even more industries can convert to the use of gas, the CNG, to bring down their energy cost. So there are all manner of ways in which we can support the small businesses all right. to go through this, this, these challenges and keep them afloat. All right, Doctor, you just reminded me of a report I read yesterday about the government tinkering with the possibility of shrinking the tax laws from about, I think, 56 or 52 to about 10. So maybe that can also um, help mitigate the impact of um, the economic uh, pressure that these businesses are also facing um, as we speak. So our Dr. Muda Yusuf, CEO of Center for Promotion of Private Enterprises, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you very much. My pleasure.